Are, there... are, are you snidely whiplash? No, I'm supporting Movember. Oh, okay. Because, you know, it's the end of Movember, and this is my epic mustache. I have to show it off. I see. And here I am, as bald as a brick. <laughs> Welcome to the final episode of 2013. Welcome to episode 271 of mm -hmm. Geeking Out. I'm Jim, this is my lovely co-host Julie, and we have six comic book reviews just for you. And let's start off with uh, Star Wars! Star Wars! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Alright, uh. this is Dawn of... This is in the Dawn of the Jedi storyline. It's Force War number one. And in this one, we're still following the same core group of characters. Um, they've passed the knowledge of how don't to... Don't ask me, folks. I don't know any of this continuity whatsoever. <laughs> they've passed along the knowledge of how to create and wield force sabers, which are entirely run off of your strength in the dark side. Ooh. Yeah, I, I must admit... I love that Force Saber so much more than the one that runs on a power cell. And it slices a mean baguette. It does. Pre-toasts and everything. Mmm, yum. So, I have to admit, guys, that I was very lost. I have not read nearly as much of the Dawn of the Jedi stuff as I want to. Luckily, Google is your friend. However... I highly recommend this on a lot of merits. They do a fantastic job of bringing you in, letting you know what you need to know. They do a fantastic job of introducing you to characters, and the art is lovely. We'll so, agree the art is really nice in this. If you're looking for a place to get into Star Wars comics, or if you're looking for a new one to add, definitely pick up Force... Force War. My apologies. All right. Next up, let's go back to the past, shall we? I love going to the past. But also into the future. Back to the future? No. Oh, my. Sorry, that's something else We're entirely. going way back. Oh, yeah? With Dr. Peabody and Mr. Sherman. What? Well, Mr. Peabody and Sherman, anyway. Um, so, yeah, if you get my joke, you know how Mr. Peabody... And Sherman originated way back on the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. But now, in 2014, they'll have a, live, a uh, CG animated movie. Oh, that's exciting. Which this is kind of a prequel series to. Oh, cool. So, and in this one, after adopting a boy named Sherman, and pretty much winning every Nobel Peace Prize and scientific merit that a dog could ever win... <laughs> Which is how many? A lot. He Dogs actually, can win he, Nobel Prize? If they're as smart as Mr. Peabody, yes. Did you hear that the guy who created the knock-knock joke won a Nobel Peace Prize? Nope. Yep. What a was it? A Nobel Peace Prize. da 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 quack But after adopting Sherman, Mr. Peabody discovers that boys need room to run and play. So he comes to the natural conclusion of building a time machine. And who would not come to that conclusion? Exactly. So that all of time can be Sherman's playground. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> Besides, as Mr. Peabody says, he already knows how everything turns out, so... What's the matter? What's the matter in changing a little bit of history, huh? You know, for as smart as he is, you'd think that he would have a very good understanding of the space-time continuum. Yeah. But they ruin a couple things. Just a couple. One or two. You know, telling the Mayans their calendar's wrong, and, for and putting back the invention of the wheel thousands of years... Do we get to see the repercussions of this in this issue? Not yet, because they're still traveling through time. So, All right. So I guess we're going to see that later. All right, so what do I think of this book? It, it's okay. It's an all-ages book 
for kids and whatnot, and it's leading into the movie. So, if you're a fan of the old school Mr. Sherman and Peabody, then you might find something to enjoy here. Um, it is done in almost a stylistic uh, Rocky and Bullwinkle style, but also a little bit newer with the CG style. But unless you're going to like that, then I don't know. But uh, other than that, it's it's a fun little book for all ages. Alrighty. This is Cataclysm Ultimate X-Men. So this is one of the, this is number one of the Ultimate X-Men Cataclysm tie-in miniseries. It's a little convoluted, but basically... As most X-Men titles are. No, it's, you can't say that because it's not just X-Men. Oh, okay. So basically what's going on with Cataclysm is that they've given us a couple of standalones, and then they've made a Cataclysm miniseries for each book in the Ultimates universe. So, this is the number one for the X-Men. What's happened is we've just experienced the Mutant War and Rogue, Storm, and a team of X-Men, including Iceman, go to retrieve some lost X-Men. While All there, those X-Men always getting lost. While there, they see a mysterious purple giant in the clouds. Gee, I wonder who that could be. Thanos? Sure. Let's go with Thanos. He's purple and giant. So guys, check this out. I enjoyed the story, though, unfortunately, I hate to say this two books in a row, I was slightly lost on it because I haven't read anything else of the Cataclysm titles. But Again, I... Google Foo. I do think that this was a really interesting story. I'm excited to see where they're going to go with it. And I loved the art. So, if you're looking for more X-Men in your diet, check it out. Though technically, don't eat the X-Men. They're, they're really high in carbs. Alright, so next up we have Legends of Red Sonja, number one. Uh, and this brings a, lot, a whole bunch of female creators into the Red Sonja universe creating all new short stories. And in this one, the Grey Riders are on a quest to kill Red Sonja. Oh, dear. Yep, but while on the hunt for their quarry, they are told tales, well, legendary tales, of uh, their target making her even more of a legend in their eyes. So That's cool. So this is an interesting one. All the stories are interconnected. Hmm. So where one story leaves off, it goes right into the next story. Oh, that's really neat. So it's all continuity based, which is really nice, and it really flows well here. Even with the different styles that are represented as well. It really flows very, very well here. And the writing style even stays consistent as well, which is kind of weird when you have like three or four writers writing on one book. So. Honestly, this was a very big surprise, and I really enjoyed it. Um, if you're a fan of Red Sonja, you're really going to enjoy this, too. And honestly, uh, anything Gail Simone writes, I'll gladly read. All right, folks, last up for me this week and this year, I guess, Yep. is Thor Crown of Fools. This is a one-shot that has two shorts, and in Crown of Fools... After being attacked in Asgard by birds, Thor and his entourage mission to find Loki and put a stop to his mischief. Man, Asgardian birds must suck. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I mean, Lady Sif and... I'm drawing a blank on names, but they actually were struggling with this giant flock of birds. It was very hitchcock Was it kind of a birdemic, as you might say? Okay. Yes. So they decide to take it upon themselves to mission and deal with the birds to protect Asgard. Thor, however, suggests that perhaps it's Loki that needs to be dealt with as his uh, continual dimension jumping is causing rifts in the world. Yeah. And things are starting to leak. A, 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 a terrible birdemic sounds like something that Loki would probably do. Yeah. So. He's probably also the one who gave us the movie birdemic. 
bastard. <laughs> Probably. Mm. Sounds like his sort of mischief. Yeah. So I loved, 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 loved the art in Crown of Fools and, and it, loved the story. It's nice to see Walt Simonson doing a new uh, Thor story as well, which is just nice. Yeah, it's just, it's beautiful to look at and wonderful. The second story, um, I believe from what I was able to glean, though I did not get time to check with Google, I believe this is a reprint story yeah, about I Baldur that's, the Brave. That's the Walt Simonson story that I was just talking about. I don't know if it's a reprint or not. Yeah, I'm not entirely certain. It it's just feels, nice to see his artwork again. It looks and feels like it's a, uh, a reprint, but I'm not certain, and as I said, I didn't get a chance to check. I was planning to, ran out of time. So, But in this one, Odin recalls Baldur to Asgard, only to send him off on a grave mission that, you know, the entire population of Asgard sort of hangs in the balance of Baldur being able to succeed in delivering this letter to Loki. Ah. Uh, Baldur and Loki have some history, which they tell us about, and Baldur accepts the mission only on the fact that Odin promises he does not have to hurt people. He does not have to fight or kill anybody or do any of that fun stuff. So, once again, I liked the story. It felt very much like an older story, but I don't find that really makes a difference in Thor books just because of the speech patterns. Yeah. Um, yeah, it works a lot of the time. Anything yeah. that you're when they're doing a traditional old school style. Yeah artwork it works really well with Thor at least but, in my opinion but. so I really enjoyed this uh, it this book did come out in September so if you want to check it out I highly recommend it and yeah all right so to close out this year we're gonna go with the big book of this week it's black science number one and in this one Grant McKay has done the impossible. He has deci deciphered black science and punched through the barriers of reality. Oh. Now Grant and his uh, team are lost barreling through dark realms trying to get home again. If only they had learned from Loki that punching holes in dimensions was a bad idea. Very bad idea. <laughs> Seems that every dimension he loses someone. Oh dear. <laughs> so, yeah, it's... Uh, very Quantum Leap-esque, um, but through dimensions and whatnot. So I guess you could also say that's Star Trek Voyager and uh, Stargate Universe. And not even so going many. to start trying to compare. Yeah. This starts off, though, as a very dark sci-fi story. And then right in the middle, it turns into Hell Comes to Frogtown. And if you don't get that joke that I'm making, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, because Jim's the only one who gets it. Yeah, pretty much. But uh, honestly, uh, as soon as it came to all the frogs and everything, I just couldn't get that movie out of my head. <laughs> and it just made me laugh. It's not a bad story overall. This is a very good, very dark, scienti uh, scientific slash fantasy-based story. So, mm -hmm. honestly, uh, beautiful artwork in this, and a very good story with interesting characters. So, honestly, as long as you can get past the frog strip-dancing part... <laughs> Just um, tell yourself it's something from Star Wars and you'll be okay. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I'll agree with you on that one. <laughs> yes, Jim agreed with me on something about Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Um, but honestly, this was a very, very interesting first issue with very interesting characters and a very interesting premise. So if you're a sci-fi fan, do yourself a favor, check this one out. All right. So that brings us to the close of this episode and to the close of another year of Geeking Out. Mm -hmm. We will see you next year. Um... Probably the first two weeks of January. So we want to wish you a very, very happy holidays.
Merry Christmas, Happy Kwanzaa, Happy Hanukkah. <laughs> happy whatever you choose to celebrate. Exactly. And we will see you soon. Have a good one.